Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our very last financial reporting webinar for 2018. It's also a good time to remind you um, that we will be scheduling monthly financial reporting webinars for 2019, one a month, and the focus next year will be on implementing IFRS 9, 15, 16, and the new not-for-profit standard AASB 1058. Uh, at the end of this webinar, later today or tomorrow, we'll circulate a link to the recording of this webinar and we'll also circulate a link to register for next year's webinars. And we hope you can join us again next year for these webinars. Now, our last webinar for this year is looking at IFRS 16 and particularly some of the problem areas uh, that we've identified over the last year. I have to say now that we are only a few days away from the effective date of IFRS 16 being 1 January 2019, more and more problems are being identified. Uh, so next year, during the year, we'll focus on uh, problems that we identified during the implementation of these new standards. So the outline for this webinar, I've grouped the problems that I'll be discussing around IFRS 16, and I've got 13 problems. Um, I've grouped them into three broad categories, one around identifying a lease, another category around determining the lease term, and the third category around measurement issues. Now, you'll see the focus of this uh, is definitely on the lessee side, and we will also cover some of the problem areas for the lessors next year. Also, it is a good time to tell you that the IASB have issued a webcast, so that's the International Accounting Standards Board, issued a webcast um, earlier in the year or late last year around determining lease term. And I've tried to pick all of that up in this webinar because it really changed the way that people have interpreted uh, IFRS 16 paragraph B34, so capital B34. So I'll flag that year today. No need to look at the webcast as well. But if you want to look at it um, and go right to the standard setter, it's available on the IASB website and it's all around determining the lease term. So let's start first of all with identifying a lease. Um, so a little bit of a recap from earlier training we've done earlier in the year. We've said if you want to identify whether uh, there's a lease or not, there's three key questions to ask. And the first one is, is there an identified asset? And then if you say, yes, I've got an identified asset, the next question is, does the lessee obtain substantially all the economic benefits uh, from that identified asset? And if you say yes to that as well, the third question is, does the lessee have the right to direct the use of that asset? So if you say yes to all three of those, you end up where you say, I've got a contract that contains a lease. If you say no to any of them, it's not a contract that contains a lease. You apply the applicable IFRS um, and that is normally like a normal service agreement. Now, identifying a lease and applying this decision tree is very important in practice. So what we're finding is that a lot of our clients uh, look at all their operating leases, finance leases, higher purchase agreements, um, anything that calls itself a legal lease, they apply these uh, this diagram and these questions and they determine whether it's a lease or not in terms of IFRS 16. The aspect that we are having trouble with is identifying leases in all other contracts and agreements. So it's leases that are embedded in managed service arrangements, in service contracts, in cleaning contracts, etc. So it's very important that as soon as you have 
any contract. So legally, that contract could be called anything. Uh, but if somewhere in, the, in that contract, embedded in the contract, um, there is a right to use an identified asset, and the lessee obtains substantially all the economic benefits from that asset, uh, and the lessee has the right to direct the use of that asset, that embedded in that contract, we have a lease. So embedded leases are very tricky. Um, if we look at it a little bit more and flush it out a little bit more, if you look at the first question or the first criteria, which is, is there an identified asset? You will remember that in earlier training we've talked about uh, typically that asset will be explicitly identified in a contract. Um, alternatively, if it's not explicitly identified in the contract, it is implicitly identified at the point at which that asset is delivered to your premises uh, or you get access to use that asset, um, that asset is made available to you. So it could be explicitly identified, it could be implicitly identified. Um, however, it's important that even if a contract specifies a particular asset, a, a customer does not have the right to use that asset if the supplier um, or potentially, in our context, the, the potential lessor, the supplier, has a substantive right to substitute the asset throughout the period of use. So, on our next slide, we then said, all right, what does this substantive uh, right look like? And they said a supplier or this potential lessor would have a substantive right if both the following conditions are met. So the supplier has the practical ability to substitute al alternative assets throughout the period of use and the supplier would benefit economically from exercising this right to substitute the asset. Um, so it's very impo important that um, in situations where the lessor has the right to substitute an asset, we would assess whether the lessor has a compelling reason to exercise that right. And if not, we would argue it's not a substantive right, um, it's only a protective right. And therefore we could still have a lease agreement. So this is a bit of an introduction to the first item or the first problem I would like to flag. So problem number one. Um, so I have put in here some relevant guidance from IFRS 16 and this one is from paragraph B15 and it, in particular it says if the supplier has a right or an obligation to substitute the asset only on or after either a particular date or the occurrence of a specified event, the supplier's substitution right is not substantive because the supplier does not have the practical ability to substitute alternative assets, and I've put in red, it's not in red in the standard, throughout the period of use. So there's this reference to throughout the period of use in order to have a substantive right. So if we apply to a question, Let's say ABC company, the lessee, enters into a four-year rail car lease agreement on the 30th of June, year one. Now, we've got three different scenarios. In scenario one, rail company, uh, the lessor, has substantive substitution rights for the remainder of the lease term, but only beginning on 1 July, year three. So for the first two years from 1 July year one, they cannot substitute. But after 1 July year three, they can. Scenario B, Railco can substitute the rail car throughout the term of the lease on the occurrence of a specific event. So only when that specific event happens can we substitute. Scenario C, Railco can substitute the rail car at 1 July year three only at a specific date. So the question is, what is the term of the lease and are the substitution rights substantive? Now, um, given what we've just discussed, I've tried to give you some context, um, con and context to it. In scenario A, 
because the substitution right is not for the entire period of the lease, it is not substantive and the lease term is therefore for the contract of four years. Um, in scenario B, since the substitution right is only for the occurrence of an event, it is not substantive and the lease term is the period of the contract of four years and the same with scenario uh, C. Um, so important to note that according to IFRS 16, paragraph B15, um, the supplier's right is not substantive because the supplier does not have the practical ability to substitute alternative assets throughout the period of use. Um, so in, this, in these scenarios, the substitution rights were not throughout the period of use. They would not be substantive and therefore uh, we've got a lease and therefore the lease term would be the period of the contract. So that's the first problem I thought we should look at around identifying a lease. So you, these rights could be substantive rights that the supplier has, or it could only be protective rights. Now, the next problem we've identified is around the allocation of consideration to lease components and non-lease components. Now, the relevant paragraph, um, IFRS 16 paragraph B15, Suitable methods for estimating the standalone selling price of a good or a service include, but are not limited to the following. So they give a few alternatives, and one of them is subparagraph C, which talks about the residual approach, um, which says an entity may estimate the standalone selling price by reference to the total transaction price less the sum of the observable standalone selling prices of other goods or services promised in the contract. However, an entity may use a residual approach to estimate in accordance with paragraph 78 the standalone selling price of a good or a service only if one of the following criteria is met. So similar to the requirements in IFRS 15, uh, where we have to allocate transaction price in step four to the various performance obligations we've identified. And IFRS 15 says, you know, you look at standalone selling price, you look at market price, you look at adjusted market price, you look at cost plus margin, you try all these other things. And it's an absolute last resort in IFRS 15. You could use a residual approach. Now, here is a similar uh, argument, you look at all these other things first, and then you would only use um, the uh, residual approach. Um, and, and if one of the following is met, the entity sells the same good or service to different customers at or near the same time for a broad range of amounts. So the selling price is highly variable because a representative standalone selling price is not discernible from past transactions or other observable, observable in, um, evidence. So you cannot really determine a standalone selling price, it's a range. Or the entity has not yet established a price for that good or service and the good or service has not previously been sold on a standalone basis. So the selling price is uncertain. So they are giving us guidance on when we can use the residual approach. Now, you would know um, and you will remember that um, there is a practical expedient that a lessee could treat the whole lease payment um, within IFRS 16 um, and recognize a right of use asset and a lease liability to make it easier. Um, but if you... Um, split out the lease components and the non-lease components, you treat them differently. If you want to make it easy and keep the two together, you have to apply IFRS 16 in that situation. So in the fact pattern that we've got, we've said ABC, the lessee, enters into a four-year building lease agreement and the breakdown of the amount of lease payments relating to cleaning services um, is not included in the lease agreement. So I've got this lease of the building and it's just one payment. I don't know what part is for cleaning services and what part is for the right to use the building. 
Um, ABC decides that they want to separate the non the lease and the non-lease components. Um, they could have used the practical um, expedient to keep it together, uh, but then they would have been forced to book a right of use asset lease liability for the whole amount. Now the question is, can ABC use the residual approach to determine the standalone value for the components? So if I just pay a thousand dollars a month, how do I know what part is for cleaning services? And the answer here is, if our criteria that we've just discussed in IFRS 16 paragraph B15 are met, ABC is allowed to use the residual approach. How, however, given the requirements, it's unlikely they will be able to, uh, would be able to would be able to because if you go back to the requirements two slides ago, um, you know. I, I think it would be hard to argue that there's a range of prices for these cleaning services, um, and also it would be hard to argue that it's a, you know it's a, it's a, it's like a startup activity. So most likely um, they would not be able to use the residual approach. In IFRS 15 on revenue, IFRS 16 on leases, really hard to use the residual approach. A lot of clients have tried to default to the residual approach, and that's why we thought we'll include it here. Now, the next part is determining the lease term. Now, this is the critical part, I would say, of today's presentation, um, because uh, we've had that IASB webcast to clarify um, the meaning of paragraph capital B34. So, a little bit of an introduction. The standard says when you determine a lease term, the lease term comprises three parts. The first one is the non cancelable period of the lease, and you look at periods covered by an option to extend the lease if the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise that option. And we've had some interesting discussions with clients on how to assess whether they are reasonably certain to extend an option or not. And it has to line up with your business model, with your 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 budgets, your forecasts. Um, you can't say, um, I'm not going to say it's reasonably certain because I want to book a small right of use asset and lease liability. And then the third component is periods covered by an option to terminate the lease if the lessee is reasonably certain not to exercise that option. So those are the three main parts of a lease term. Now to determine the lease term, we go and we look at paragraph B34. And in paragraph B34, and I, I might just... Uh, go back to the actual paragraph, uh, and this is a critical paragraph, I would say one of the most problematic but most important paragraphs um, in IFRS 16. When you look at lease term, it says in determining the lease term and assessing the length of the non cancelable period of a lease, uh, which we've covered on the previous slide. You have to come up with a non cancelable period of the lease. When you do that, an entity shall apply the definition of a contract and determine the period for which the contract is enforceable. So, to determine the non cancelable period, we have to look at the period to which the contract is enforceable. Now, they go on, and the next sentence is summarized on the slide. A lease is no longer enforceable when the lessee and the lessor each has the right to terminate the lease without permission from the other with no more than an insignificant penalty. Now, when you look at what is the meaning of an insignificant penalty, I think initially people were looking at penalties as included in the contract. And what this webcast is really clarifying, to assess if, to assess if there's an insignificant penalty, the analysis needs to include both what is explicitly stated in the contract as well as other kinds of economic penalties that may not be included in the contract. 
So um, termination clauses must have economic substance to be considered. Now, what does this mean? Let's look at some examples because we've got complicated uh, words here. I suppose when I looked at this uh, this decision tree or, or this slide, um, you know, I'm Afrikaans speaking and English with the double negatives, I find really hard. I'm very honest about it. And there's a lot of double negatives going on here. So I sat down and I said, um, another way to put the slide is to say a lease is enforceable because we want to look for enforceable leases. A lease is enforceable if the lessee has the right to terminate um, with a significant penalty. So the lessee has the right to terminate, but there would be a significant penalty involved. So in that case, we still say the lease is enforceable. Or, and it's not an and, it's an or, the lessor has a right to terminate with a significant penalty only. So as soon as the lessee or the lessor can terminate the contract, but it would involve a significant penalty, and that's not just the penalty within the contract, it would be other economic um, penalties, then we've got an enforceable contract. So I've just tried to state it in a positive manner. All right, so let's look at examples and see how this rolls. So lease term, and example number three. In this example, we've said, lessee A enters into a 14-year lease of a property. Now, the lease contract includes a termination clause every two years, and this can only be exercised by, exercised by lessee A. Now, the lease contract does not require lessee A to make a termination payment to the lessor if it exercises the termination option. So the contract has an insignificant penalty. And lessee A is reasonably certain that it will not exercise the termination option for 10 years. So in this situation, what is the lease term? Um, so the lessee says, I've got a 14-year lease. Um, every two years, I've got the option to walk away. In this situation, what is the lease term? Um, and they, they've assessed that they're reasonably certain to exercise. So the lease term in this situation would be 10 years. Um, and it's, a 10-year lease term can be enforced by the lessee. Lessee A does not expect to exercise termination options for a period of 10 years. Um, so IFRS 16 paragraph B34 is not applicable here um, because uh, the lease is only not enforceable if both parties can terminate the lease. So in this situation, only one party can terminate the lease and therefore we've got an enforceable uh, agreement. So that's the first one and that's the normal one. So that's a little bit of an introduction and also the one that the IASB webcast started with. So the lease term, 10 years, um, paragraph B34 is not really a factor. Let's, you know, we're warming up. The next example is what if Lessie B enters into a 14-year lease for a property? Now, the lease contract includes a termination clause every two years. Now, this clause can be exercised by both lessee B and the lessor. So both of them have a termination option. The lease contract does not require either lessee B or the lessor to make a termination payment if either party exercises this termination clause. So if you just read up to there, I think traditionally people would have said in this situation, we don't have an enforceable contract. However, if we go on, it says, Lessie B has installed expensive leasehold improvements that have an expected useful life of approximately 10 years. Now, lessor would incur significant cost if they have to find a new tenant. So although there are no termination penalties written into the contract, both of them will incur significant other economic penalties if they cancel this agreement. So what factors should Lessie B consider when determining the lease term? 
So I think if we go through the different stages, first of all, we have to determine if this lease is enforceable under IFRS 16 paragraph B34. Um, so we have to consider if either party has more than an insignificant penalty for term terminating. So the things you think at is a cash penalty, having to relocate premises, undertaking leasehold improvements, um, you know, if it's not used for the full useful life, finding a new tenant. Um, and if Lessie B considers there's no insignificant penalty of any type for either party, um, the lease term would be two years. Lessie B would be likely to conclude uh, this is the case. Now, what's important um, in this situation um, that we have to first of all look at, you know, step one, um, do we, is it enforceable? There, however, there's a step two. And the step two is if there is a significant penalty. Now, based on the facts that we've got here, I think there's a significant penalty because we've made the leasehold improvements um, and the lessor would have to find significant cost. So actually, when we look at the fact pattern that we've got here, um, it is likely that there's a significant penalty for Lessie B up until the end of year 10 because of the remaining useful life of the leasehold improvements. There's also a significant penalty for the lessor because it would incur significant costs to find a new tenant. Now, Lessie B is likely to assess that the lease term, therefore, is 10 years, being the length of time its leasehold improvements are expected to be used. So, again, it's very important that we go through the two stages. And the first part is to determine whether we've got an enforceable contract. Now, again, I come back to my positive decision tree. In my positive decision tree, I've said a lease is enforceable if the lessee has the right to terminate, but there would be a significant penalty. And I would say, yes, we've got that here. Or, and it's not an and, it's an or. Um, the lessor has a right to terminate, but there would be a significant penalty. Now, in this question, um, we therefore have an enforceable agreement. Uh, and it's actually, I would say, very clear because both parties will suffer uh, a significant penalty. So that's really important to look at, that we don't only look at the termination payments within the contract. So this can significantly change how our clients determine lease term. Because if you said you just looked at the contract, you would have said insignificant termination penalty, and you would have said lease term two years. However, if we take into account all these other factors, we would say there's a significant penalty, and now the lease term is 10 years. So th there are definitely challenges in applying paragraph B34 in practice, um, you know, to determine what constitute more than an insignificant penalty or what would constitute a significant penalty is highly judgmental. Um, so it's just another judgment being introduced by IFRS 16. Um, how do you know what the lessor cost would be to find a new tenant if you're the lessee? Um, and the lessee need to consider changing circumstances within its control when reassessing the lease term. So you only look at things within your control when you look at these, um, the, the lease term. All right, so let's take it a bit further and let's look at a number five, still on lease term. So Lessie C enters into a 10 year lease for a property. Now, after the initial 10 year period, the lease continues until either party terminates the lease um, and they only have to give a three months notice. So there's a 10 year lease, after that it rolls on um, and there's this option to exit every three months. Now, I have seen this scenario very often in practice uh, where we talk about a holdover arrangement. The lease term has finished, uh, maybe we are still renegotiating the new terms um, or maybe we just continue to use the property, um, especially in the not-for-profit public sector world, we see this a lot. 
Now, the lease contract does not require either lessee C or the lessor to make a termination payment if either party exercises its, its termination clause. Um, so, you know, after the 10-year period, if you want to walk away, you just give notice, lessee or lessor, no termination payment, off we go. So, what factors should lessee C consider when determining the lease term? So, first of all, um, you have to consider whether the requirements of IFRS 16 paragraph B34 apply because both the lessee and the lessor have the option of terminating the lease after that non cancelable period of 10 years. Um, <clears throat> now, to know whether the paragraph would apply, you have to consider whether there's an insignificant or significant penalty for terminating. So you have to, again, look at potential cash penalties, um, having to relocate premises. Um, maybe you've undertaken leasehold improvements that's going to last for 20 years. Um, <coughs> what would be the cost of finding a new tenant? Now, if either lessee C or the lesser would suffer some form of economic loss for terminating the contract, uh, then there is more than an insignificant penalty and the lease contract is considered to be enforceable. So, again, it is if the lessee or the lessor will suffer some kind of economic penalty, we would say the contract is enforceable. Now, lessee C would need to consider the lease term in the same way as it, it did earlier in part one. Now, if we move on to step two, if there is more than an insignificant, more than a significant penalty, the contract is enforceable and the lease term needs to be determined the same um, way we did previously. Um, so this will be extremely difficult to assess in practice. And when deciding on the lease term, the lessee would need to consider other factors of so past practice and reasonable expectations. Now, for instance, I'll give you an example. If you are leasing, um, let's say you're a government department and you are leasing a building in the CBD, you've got a large workforce. Um, after the 10 years, it's now on a three-month notice, uh, hold on or rolling on uh, arrangement. If you are going to continue to need staff, and, um, you know, and they're going to stay in that building because it's a good location. People want to come to the CBD to do um, whatever transactions they do with that arrangement. You know you're going to have the same staff levels. It would be really hard to argue um, that there won't be some kind of, um, you know, past practice supporting that you're going to stay in that building. Um, you, and remember, this is after we've decided there's a significant penalty. Um, so we've said there's a significant uh, significant penalty. Maybe it is because, uh, you know, we've got signage up, we've got fit out, we redid the place, etc. Uh, people know about it. So we've already decided there's some kind of significant penalty, although there's not a cash payment involved. And then you look at past practice. Then you look at reasonable expectation. Um, so it's very important that... Uh, before we get to step two, we first have to start off by asking, do we have these uh, significant penalties? If it's only insignificant penalties, uh, so we can just relocate to another building, um, et cetera, then we would never get to step two where we look at the past experience. So it's really important to apply this in, in, in order. So we look at wider economic factors. Um, if lessee C considers all types of penalties would be insignificant, uh, then they would say, listen, it's only a 10-year lease term. So the first assessment is, do we have significant penalties, including things not written into the contract? And the second step then is, how do we determine the lease term? Another one on lease term. Question six, so Lessie D enters into a 10-year lease for a property. Now, after the initial 10-year period, the lease includes a rolling 12-month extension option. 
Now, there's no end date to the number of potential extension options. So it's going to roll on forever. The lease therefore continues until either party decides not to extend the lease. If either party decides not to extend the lease after that initial 10-year period, no termination payments are required according to the contract. Now, let's assume the lease contract is enforceable for the 10-year initial lease period. Let's assume that. And at the end of year 10, the, the lessee D extends the lease for an additional 12 months. And lessee D had only included the initial 10-year period in its initial estimate of the lease term. Um, now, at the end of year 10, can lessee D apply IFRS 16 short-term lease exemption to the lease for that additional 12 months. So initially we had a lease for 10 years. Um, then we've decided to, to renew this extension option for 12 months. And we're saying, but you know, if we, we basically now just have a contract for 12 months, it's a short term lease, uh, we're not going to bring it on the balance sheet. Can we do that? Is that allowed? Uh, and the answer is no. That short-term lease exemption will only apply um, if you, right from the start, only enter into a lease for less than 12 months. Um, if you have a lease term and then you all the way had a lease term with extension options and you change your assessment on whether you'll exercise extension options or not, it's a reassessment of the lease term um, and you can't use the short-term uh, lease exemption. So the short-term lease exemption is not supposed to be used in these circumstances. The short-term lease exemption is only intended as a cost-saving measure to get the simple and clearly short-term leases off balance sheet. So car hires, a Christmas period, pop-up pop shops, etc. So I think very interesting that in this webcast, the IAE, ISB clarified, uh, let's call it the spirit of what they tried to achieve with the short-term lease exemption. Another one which is extremely inter interesting and that I often see within our not-for-profit and public sector client base again, but I think one would be able to potentially see it in the in a for-profit context, is um, leases with non-consecutive or intermittent periods of use. Now, the definition of a lease term is the non cancelable period for which a lessee has the right to use an underlying asset, together with both periods covered by the option to extend and that um, termination option. Now, the definition of period of use is the total period of time that an asset is used to fulfill a contract with a customer, including any non consecutive periods of time. So, Let's make a practical example of this. So in the first scenario, holiday company enters into a two-year lease agreement. Um, the months available for use are November, December, and January. Uh, the same store location to be provided each year. So I own, I'm only going to lease um, this space um, for three months of the year, but I sign a two-year agreement. The second one, a sports team, and we often see this with sporting clubs, not for profits. A sports team enters into a 15-year stadium lease agreement. Um, and it is available for use for 30 non-consecutive home games per year. So I'm thinking um, the Marvel Stadium, the former Etihad Stadium in Melbourne. If one of the AFL clubs is leasing the stadium, for a Friday, um, for their home games, for a 15-year period. Um, question, would the leases with lease terms greater than 12 months be considered short-term leases? Now, I suppose a simple reading of it, we would say, listen, um, you sign an agreement in scenario one, two years, um, you're only going to use it for certain months, but it's a two-year agreement. It's not short-term. And the other one is, you know, it's a 15-year agreement. It's not short-term. However, if we analyze it according to IFRS 16, in scenario one, the lease term is two years. 
the period of actual use is only six months. And therefore, you, you could argue it's a short-term lease and use the short-term lease exemption. In scenario two, our lease term is 15 years, but our period of use, if you work out the number of days, is 450 days, and therefore we've got a long-term lease. So you don't look at the length of the contract in isolation, you actually look at the period of use uh, to determine whether it's a short-term or long-term lease. So that's a very interesting one, again, for our client base. Um, in question eight, I've just referred again to the IISB webcast that we've just worked through, and I've quoted paragraph B34, and you can see there if you want to look at <coughs> the staff webcast, um, it was issued in October 2017, and you can look at that. My example at this stage to recap is, let's say ABC enters into a 10-year warehouse lease, um, both the lessor and ABC have the right to terminate the contract with no contractual penalties. Um, ABC has significant leasehold improvements in the warehouse, and the warehouse is located in a, re a remote location where ABC would have limited replacement options. So what we're trying to say in that last bullet point, because it's, they're going to struggle to find another tenant, one could argue if they cancel, there would be a significant penalty for them. Now, are economic penalties considered in determining, um, you know, the more than an insignificant penalty in B34? And we've already discussed it, absolutely. Uh, but it's going further to say, uh, you will consider damage to your market reputation. You would consider damage to customer relationships. Um, you'll consider the importance of the asset to the operation of the en of the entity's business. So it really is very wide, uh, all the potential economic penalties that one should consider. There's a list in the standard, but it's not um, an all-inclusive list. All right. If we move on to the third um, session for today, or the third section, we move on to some measurement issues. Now, I have found in implementing IFRS 16 with clients that one of the most controversial aspects around measurement is actually restoration obligations. So I've started by providing some guidance here, um, an extract from the new IFRS 16 paragraph 24D, which looks at the, the right of use assets should include um, this restoration um, costs. Um, it is very similar to the requirement we currently have in IAS 16. Uh, or double ASB 116, paragraph 16C, uh, where we say included in the cost of property, plant and equipment, we put that restoration provision. And then another uh, very relevant paragraph is paragraph BC 148, so the basis of conclusions. And it says that the initial measurement of a right of use asset at cost is consistent with the measurement of many other non-financial assets, such as assets within the scope of IAS 16 property, plant and equipment, IAS 38 intangible assets. Now, measuring right of use assets on a basis similar to that used to measure the underlying asset maintains the comparability of amounts reported for leased and owned assets, which contributes to the usefulness of the information provided to users of financial statements. So it's the reasoning why the requirements in IFRS 16 are so similar to the requirements in IAS 16 and IAS 38. Now, in a scenario, in an example, in this scenario, I've said, let's say ABC enters into a seven-year building lease and they are required to return the building at the end of the lease in the same condition as at lease commencement. Um, they install leasehold improvements, uh, you know, something like an internal staircase that you install in a building that you have to remove when you move out. Um, and the removal of those leasehold improvement are estimated to cost, let's say, $3,000. Um, how is this restoration obligation accounted for? So it's a lease, um, and how do we account for it? So under the new IFRS 16, ABC records a provision of 3,000, 
uh, when the leasehold improvements are installed, and that provision is recorded in terms of the current IAS 37 or double ASB 137. Um, and the important part is the debit of the 3000 would go to the right of use asset. So therefore, that cost of 3000 is included in depreciation over the term of the lease. Um, and if there's a change in the estimate, um, you'll change your provision and you'll also change the cost of your right of use asset. Now, a lot of you would say, a letter, fantastic, we get it, we see it, it's the same as IS-16. My question to you to be, would be, what are you currently doing with leases of buildings? Um, so under the existing uh, operating lease standard, if you've got a leasehold improvement, currently you have to say credit that provision under IS-37, the 3000. And what are you currently debit? Um, and currently, one would argue you have to debit a leasehold improvement under IAS 16, and that leasehold improvement have to be depreciated. Um, so uh, my question is, are you currently applying the current standard correctly around these leasehold provisions? Um, if you're currently doing it right under um, IFRS 16, it's not such a big difference. However, if in the past you've maybe expensed it, etc., um, you know, you have to consider how are you going to transition. The next scenario um, that I would like to look at is, let's say, same scenario, uh, facts as in scenario A, we enter into a seven-year building lease and we're required to return the building at the end of the lease in the same condition as at lease commencement. Um, we install leasehold improvements. Now, the removal of the leasehold improvements are estimated to cost 5,000. The building incurs minor damage as a result of normal wear and tear. And repairing the minor damage is estimated to cost $500 for each year that we are actually a tenant. So the fact that we're going to be a tenant for seven years means there's a fixed 5,000 uh, to fix the leasehold improvements, um, but there's also expectation that we'll pay another 3,500 at the end of the seven years um, for the wear and tear. So the question would be, um, I just want to test, can everybody still hear me? Um, because a funny button came up. Let me just text my, uh, test my audio. Can you still hear me? Can you quickly send me a message in the question box, if you don't mind? In the question box, if you can hear me, just um, shoot me a quick note. That would really help. Uh, or in the chat room. Uh, in the chat room or in the question box. If you could maybe just, okay, so you can hear. Perfect, sorry. I just heard a, um, you know, a, a, a sound in my ears and I thought maybe I've lost connection. All right. I'm sorry, let me pick it up. So what we've said here, there's two types of provisions. The one is for the removing the leasehold improvements, the 5,000, and there's another for the 3,500 at the end, and that is due to damage that we cause slowly as we use the building over seven years. So how is that accounted for? So what we'll do is that ABC records a provision for that additional 500 each year, and they will also, the, so the credit to the provision is built up, but we debit an expense for the minor damages that have incurred during the, that occurred during the year. So we will still on day one have a provision for the 5,000 after we've done the leasehold improvements. The other 500, and, and sorry, that 5,000 is credit provision, debit, right of use asset, it will be part of depreciation. The damage that we cause over the period of the lease will be credit uh, provision 500 every year, uh, but the debit is not to the right of use asset, the debit is um, an expense.
And that is consistent of how we would currently have done it under IAS 16. The next question, um, if we have a lease liability for an interest only lease, how do we account for it? So in this example, ABC enters into a seven year lease uh, there's a notional capital of the lease is 10,000. The annual payment of LIBOR multiplied by the notional capital amount. So LIBOR times your 10,000 will give you your annual payment. Um, the notional amount of 10,000 is due at termination date. And LIBOR at lease commencement date is 3%. Um, and let's assume it remains constant for this example. What amount is included in the lease liability on lease commencement for these lease payments? So it's important that um, if there's that variability, um, we would only include the current LIBOR rate of 3%. Um, and it, so therefore we know it's the 300, 300, 300 for the six years and the end of year seven, the 10,000 and the 300. Now I appreciate that the LIBOR rate every year could be different, but that's a variable amount and we'll deal with it similar to a CPI adjustment in each particular year. Um, in substance, fixed lease payments is another interesting area um, that we're seeing in practice. So there's a lot being said about um, in substance fixed lease payments. You know that only fixed lease payments are taken into the calculation of the lease liability. Variable lease pay payments are not included. However, they have said that uh, we should consider whether some of these variable lease payments are actually in substance fixed lease payments. So you could have a look at that. Let's look at an example instead. Cleaning company, a cleaning equipment and supplies company enters into a three year industrial cleaning equipment lease with supplies company. Lease payments for the cleaning equipment are nothing. As part of the arrangement, is, um, ABC is not required to purchase cleaning bags, so there is no minimum purchase required. However, if ABC does purchase cleaning bags, they need to be purchased from cleaning company. Now, based on past experience, cleaning company has used a thousand bags per year. Now, cleaning company expects that it's highly probable that it will use at least 800 bags per year. Does the lease agreement contain in substance fixed payments? So we don't have a fixed amount that we pay. We only pay for the bags. The bags that we use depend on how many bags we use. Um, so do we have an in substance fixed payment? And the answer here is no. Um, the standard says that variable lease payments based on the use of the underlying asset are excluded from the measurement of the lease payment. Um, the fact that it's highly probable that we're going to use 800 bags is not relevant. All right, so it's a variable lease payment. It depends on the use of an asset. Um, you can avoid using that asset and therefore avoid making this payment. And therefore it's excluded from the calculation of the lease liability. If you look at the next one, we get a lot of questions on the measurement side around incremental borrowing rate. Now IFRS 16 in paragraph 26 talks about the lease payments shall be discounted using the interest rate implicit in the lease if that rate can be readily determined. If that rate cannot be readily determined, the lessee shall use the lessee's incremental borrowing rate. So implicit rate in the lease is not um, readily determined by the lessee. That's our assumption. Um, let's say the subsidiary does not have its own treasury function. So the treasury function sits in the parent. All funding for the group is managed centrally by the parent. Now questions. Can the subsidiary use the parent's incremental borrowing rate? And secondly, can the subsidiary use the parent's internal rate for transfer pricing? Now, very important here, the answer is no to both questions. IFRS 16 paragraph 26 states the lessee is required to use its own
incremental borrowing rate. Um, now, in the April meeting of the ISB, they considered that having a centralized treasury function is irrelevant, um, even though it's managed practically centrally, um, that's irrelevant. Um, we need to determine an incremental borrowing rate for each su subsidiary and also for the parent. Um, you need to consider other factors that could influence the pricing offered by the lessor to the subsidiary. So current exchange rates, tax, local uh, regulations, etc. If we move on to our last problem for today, and we'll pick it up again next year in January, um, we look at the reassessment of the lease liability um, and paragraph 42b states that a lessee shall remeasure the lease liability by discounting the revised lease payments if either there's a change in future lease payments, etc. Um, so fact pattern. On the th uh, we've got a 31 December year end. Our initial non cancelable term of three years is ending on 31 December year one. We've got an option to extend it for two years. There's a, a rent review upon extension. So we know what our payments will be for the first three years. After the first, the first three years before we extend, there's a market review or rent review. Um, and then also they say the rent change rent retroactive to the day of the lease extension period, which would be 1 January year 2. Now, note that it can take a period of time to perform the rent review. So, it, you know, sometimes it can take more than 12 months. So, we continue to use the property, um, but we haven't formalized the agreement. We haven't formalized the rent review, etc. Um, the lessee is able to reliably estimate the revised rent. So the lessee has a good idea what the revised rent is, but it's not in the contract yet. Should a liability be recorded for the retrospective payment at 31 December year one, even before we've signed the contract to document what the rent review number is? And in this instance, it says no liabilities recognized at 31 December. Um, it's because the lease is in the scope of IFRS 16, IFRS 16 paragraph 42B applies in determining the timing of recording of this retrospective payment. And the timing of recording the payment is dependent on the terms of the lease agreement um, with regards to when the payment is made. So 13 potential problems that we've seen in practice. So we've looked at identifying a lease, especially around embedded leases. We've looked at determining the lease term and very specifically the IASB webcast and paragraph um, paragraph B34, and then also measurement issues, um, which we've discussed. I would like to thank um, all of you um, for attending these webinars every month. It's amazing to speak to you every month and to also then run into you across Australia and even New Zealand when we do presentations. Um, if you're looking for advice, these are the people to contact. That's our big team. Questions, please contact me. Um, I would like to say a, a Merry Christmas to you. I hope you have a great festive season um, and a very uh, happy new year. I'll speak to you again in 2019. Please look out for those registration emails. If you've got any suggested topics that you would like me to cover um, or um, suggested problem areas, please send them through. But thank you very much uh, for this year and uh, we'll speak again in 2019. Take care.